Hey everybody, bad news, all the preachers are out of town, <laughs> and you're stuck with me. Uh, more bad news, I don't use the ESV, so if your translation of the ESV differs a little from mine, I have the New American Standard on that, but if you'd fasten your seat belts, check your overhead luggage rack, they have given me 35 minutes to do a three-hour sermon. So we'll do the best we can. So turn in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. We're going to be offering the book of Hebrews in next spring's classes. So I thought we'd look at that with a title, always read the fine print on your warranty. I love Costco. I do all of my tithes and offerings. I just spent almost 600 bucks at Costco on Friday. I uh, didn't know I spent that much until they gave me the total, but I love it because you can go to Costco and they have a warranty and a guarantee that if you're not happy, what? Bring it back. Bring it back. Support Costco on that. So I know a lady, I'm from Santa Clarita, she bought one of those fresh cut Christmas trees in the lot. <laughs> And so after Christmas, about three weeks after Christmas, she brought it back and said, I'm not happy. They said, why? She said, the whole thing turned brown and all the needles fell off. They gave her her money back. I think that's good. I'm giving you an idea of how to get a free Christmas tree, okay? I uh, also know a guy, my friend, that took a TV back after seven years, and they took it back. Then they instituted that policy now, right after that, 90 days, we take the TV back. But So he, I, I'm personal friends with the guy who ruined that for all of us. <laughs> all right. Whoop. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? Paul did. No, oh, he did. Why did he put his name in there, Dave, if he wrote it? Because he says things in Hebrews that upset the audience. The audience are Hebrew Christians who had believed in Jesus as Messiah they were under persecution. We'll tell more about this. And then Paul's going to say some things that is biblically spot on from the Old Testament. But if you were a follower of Moses for 1,500 years, wouldn't you have trouble changing tracks? And so Paul even caused a riot in Acts because he was preaching that the Mosaic covenant is over. We're going to talk about that. And that upset some of them. So he didn't put his name on it right away, the church fathers tell us. And there are some things that you should look at when you look at the book of Hebrews. How many have ever heard of the two passages on the new covenant? Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Anybody ever read those? Apparently, Nicodemus didn't because when he comes to Jesus and sits down, Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're the teacher of Israel and you've never read those? You must be what? That's where Jesus used that illustration because of those two verses right there, or those two sections right there. And remember what Jesus said when he was just about to go to suffer on the cross. This cup is poured out for you for the new covenant in my blood. Hebrews frequently quotes and mentions the new covenant. Over and over and over because these precious Hebrews and the Gentiles also need to know that Jesus, Messiah, has inaugurated a qualitatively better covenant. Better. There are two great messianic psalms that frequently are quoted in Hebrews that was part of the earliest church's preaching that not too many people may be aware of. Psalm 2, you are my son. The Lord has a son. Psalm 110, and that son would be of the order of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Oh, is that important. So what's the theme of Hebrews? It compares, and you've got to keep this in mind, the Mosaic Old Covenant and that of what Jesus inaugurated. So it's a comparison and 13 times this is the word used. You ready? Better. You ever see that commercial where you pick up the 
thing and it goes butter, you know, it, just remember right here as you open up, you should hear a better. <laughs> so what's the theme? The finality of the absolute revelation in Christ as, contracted, as uh, contrasted with the temporality of Moses in the Old Covenant. You're going to be shocked at what Paul says about the Mosaic Covenant. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You're going to be shocked that we went back. What Paul says, it talks about the absolute superiority of the New Covenant under Jesus. Mosaic Covenant, remember this. It's expired. It's gone. We're going to talk about that in a second. Why was it expired? Well, it was temporary. It was piecemeal. It was incomplete. It wasn't effective, but it was designed to show God's people that they could not be righteous enough to qualify for right standing before God. The new covenant whoop, is right now in full force. Don't let you everybody ever tell you in their theology that somehow there are two new covenants or this is just temporary. The new covenant for you is in full force. Everything that Jesus will do extends from this new covenant. It is eternal. It is wondrous. And it's marvelous. Look what it says about the new covenant, and I put it in red. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant. Nothing can ever replace or will take the place of the new covenant under Jesus. Nothing. No anything of Moses can ever come back. The Lord Jesus canceled it. It's over. It's an eternal covenant, the new covenant. Moses is gone. So if the new covenant is eternal, it never ends, you need to say bye-bye to Moses. Great guy. He was a faithful servant, the book says. He gave the law. But... Hebrews says something that's very interesting that Christians, this book is greatly neglected by a lot of Christians. For when the priesthood is changed, Jesus inaugurated, what we will find out is the Melchizedekian eternal priesthood. There takes place a change of law. So what does that mean? Moses is gone. Now wait a second, Pastor Dave. What about the Ten Commandments? How dare you? I know what people think. How dare you? Are you a libertine, antinomian? But look what it says in verse 18. For on one hand, there is a nullification of a former commandment, that is, Moses' commands, because of its weakness and... What's that term there that he uses? Uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. Paul tells us this in Romans. What was the purpose of law? To teach us, Lord, I can't measure up to this. There are 613 commands. How in the wide world do you do that? How do you do that too? I guess they're lost on that. What's going on? Did I do something? Oh. You want to do it? Go ahead. I get extra time just in case. Matter of fact, they may want me to quit early. I don't know what happened. Is that okay? Okay. Just trust me when I'm telling you these verses, it actually says that even though you have the ESV, okay? For the law was useless, it was weak. On the other hand, there is the introduction of a better hope, new covenant. You should be new covenant people and new covenant aware. The Aaronic priesthood that we talked about in class, in New Testament history class, they're gone forever. Aaron's gone. The Zadokines are gone. Bye-bye. Jesus has inaugurated the Melchizedekian priesthood, which is qualitatively, completely so much different, so much better. 
After quoting the new covenant in Jeremiah 31, or in uh, Hebrews 8, 13, which is from Jeremiah, here is what Paul said. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first Moses obsolete. And whatever is becoming obsolete and get growing old is ready to disappear. Hebrews 10, 1, for the law is only a shadow when the priests went in and did what they did, it was a pop-up book lesson for the reality of Jesus and the Melchizedekian priesthood. He was teaching them through object lessons, through flannel, flannel graph. Remember that? What it was about. Colossians 2, where Paul also wrote that, it's a shadow of what things are to come. So Moses is bye-bye. Moses retired. Mosaic covenant gone. New everything, new promises, new priests, new regulations. What about the Ten Commandments, Dave? Because I know I hear people saying that there's 613 mitzvahs, they call them. Well, let me tell you, some will say, I'm under the Ten Commandments. Well, not really. Let me pause there, let that sink in as they get to throw me off the stage. Do you know that there's what's called the curse of the law? The Jews and God never viewed the Mosaic legislation as the Ten Commandments, then ceremonial, then judicial, and then moral. It was all one unit. If you ate shrimp and lobster and had a ham sandwich, you violated the whole law. You can't choose just ten to keep under the Mosaic Covenant. You have to keep it all. And Paul called that in Galatians... That's the curse. Violate one, you violate all. So if you're going to choose the Ten Commandments, then you've got to keep the whole schmear, as the Yiddish term would be. James 2.10 echoes this. Jesus' half-brother, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, guilty of it all. That's the curse of the law. That's why it was designed to show us we have to have a perfection before God that we ourselves cannot do. So what law are we under if we're not under the Ten Commandments? You're under the law of Christ. Paul says love is the fulfilling of the law. Bad theology says, well, you know, love, that sounds a little bit wimpy, wimpy, wimpy. No, Paul says love is the fulfilling of the law. Here's what you ask. Would you kill somebody? Would you steal? Would you do the things if you really love God and your fellow believer? See, we're under that love. It's so much easier than all 613 mitzvahs that they had to do. You are under the law of Christ, the law of love. Moses is gone. That doesn't mean we can get away with literally murder. It does mean, though, we under a completely better covenant. So let's give you the background as we get into this. Paul is writing to Jewish Christians. They're part of the church, by the way. They're not separate from the church. They're in the church. He, these are Hebrew congregations. They've trusted in Jesus as Messiah. They've left Moses, the temple, the old covenant. They've become a part of Jesus' true people, the church, his true people, Upon this rock, I will build my church. They've declared their faith in Jesus as the Messiah. Ah, uh, but horrific persecution. We read in Hebrews 12 that they had been imprisoned, the property confiscated. The Jewish groups that didn't follow Jesus were using their authority with the Roman government to persecute the church. And to be honest with you, I feel very... I feel a lot for these precious Christians. They wanted to go back to the temple and the synagogue to hide. They thought if Moses was a foreshadowing, maybe we could go back to temple. Maybe we could hide for a little bit. Maybe we could retreat to Moses temporarily. After all, is not the old covenant the foundation of the new? You can rationalize that way. And they were in fear for their life. They had come to the point where they were almost going to be murdered for their testimony of Jesus Christ. There's a statement in the New Testament, especially John and Acts, that 
Many times the early church, which was composed of Jewish people for fear of the Jews, that they would be put out of the synagogue, well, time has gone on now and they're facing losing their life for their testimony of Jesus the Messiah. I often wondered why didn't they like Messiah Jesus? Well, I think if I look at it, they wanted a conquering Messiah, one that would slaughter the Roman Gentiles, put in the Jewish kingdom, and they were interested in killing everybody out of vengeance for what the nation had suffered. Jesus came and wanted to save everybody. We're here tonight because Jesus, the true Messiah, said, I want you in my kingdom too. Not just Hebrews. I want Gentiles, and I'm going to put them in one new body, the church, and I will save them all. Jesus is in the business of saving. So they retreated, or they were thinking about it. They were tempted to retreat, go back to the temple. By the way, that's, in Hebrews, that's a very fatal error. Paul will warn them, if you dare fall back to Moses, if you dare go back to what God canceled, there's a terrible warning that if they retreat, it's the same thing like the first generation out of Egypt did. Have you ever read about the first generation out of Egypt? God does miracles, gets them greatly delivered from Pharaoh, uh, just delivers his people with ten tremendous miracles. And you know what they say every time they face something stressful? And I sympathize. Oh, that we could go back to Egypt for the leeks and the garlic. They were ungrateful. And here is what Paul said. Just like the first generation out of Egypt wanted to go back to Egypt and run, if you do that same thing, you'll end up like them. They will never enter into the promised land. And in this case, in Hebrews, it's the coming millennial kingdom. If you retreat from Christ, like they wanted to go back to Egypt, you will never get in to the millennial kingdom. Now I know that brings up the question, well now can we lose our salvation, Pastor Dave? Take my class and find out. I'll tell you about that. <laughs> there are war Boy, that was a cheap plug. I'll tell you that. There are some warning passages in Hebrews and they each get more severe and more severe and more severe. He'll give them some information and he'll say, in light of this information, if you retreat, if you dare retreat, there are going to be some penalties for this. And there are these five warning passages finally ending in the crescendo of 12, 14 through 29. So, in light of the fact that we have a better covenant, in light of the fact that it is absolutely, honestly, incomparable to the old, we need to look at the fine print the fine print is, let's look at the guarantor of the covenant in 14 and 15, and let's look at the guarantee of that. Let's look at the warranty, and that's what we want to look at tonight. And my, the thing that Don made for you has every word from the New American Standard, so if you wonder where I'm at, you can use that as a guide. And by the way, this never expires, so what we're about to say will be true for eternity because it's an eternal covenant. So what is the new covenant warranty? Well, when we look, we look at chapter 4, verse 14. You should see in your Bible a therefore. And there's an old preacher saying, when you see a therefore, you look to see why it's therefore. The therefore goes back to 2.17, that Jesus as our helper of humanity and his people became human for the purpose of being merciful and faithful to you. Did you just hear that? Jesus became man, human, 
so he could be merciful and faithful in helping you. It also goes back to 3, 1 through 6, where Paul talks about Moses and his covenant. Nice while it was here, Jesus canceled it and inaugurated the new covenant. Moses was a servant. Jesus is the son. So much better. So let's look. Therefore, in light of the fact that Jesus became human, oh, that's so key, and inaugurated this new covenant so much better than Moses. Now look at the next word. Since we have, I think, is how it's translated, that you should put above that is this. Always have. That's the emphatic part of these first verse 14, that this, what we're about to go through, the quality that we are going to discuss is something 24-7. It never closes down for you, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what trouble you get yourself into, and I can relate to that. This is always 24-7. Now remember, he's contrasting the old covenant priests here. Good luck. Call him up. I want to talk to the high priest. He's not available. Or there were no high priests. Or the wrong high priests. But this is saying there's some very miraculous supernatural thing that each one of us, no matter where we are, 24-7 doing the dishes, driving the car, the most awkward places you can be, he's always there to give you individualized, specialized attention. This is what this means here, having. Having. This is what you can expect. Then look what it says. In contrast to the Mosaic Aaronic priests, Jesus is the great high priest. Now, I don't know if you have an A there. It shouldn't have an A. It should have the great high priest in your translation. There is no one else like this. He is great, and no priest in the Mosaic Covenant was ever great. If you look at their history... All the priests in the Old Testament were interested in were money or even the wrong priests were there. They were crooked and they were corrupt. But Jesus is the great high priest. This means there is a great difference. He is your defense attorney. John says in John chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, that he is always there to make intercession and defense of you. You want a shocking verse, Revelation 12, 10? Satan is before the throne of God even now, and you know what he's doing in Revelation 12, 10? He's saying bad things about me. You know what? I know the devil is a liar, but, you know, i got to be honest, some of it is true. And you know what Jesus says? That's my client. You're not going to get away with that. He defends you. You, can guarantee, you are guaranteed with Jesus and his priestly ministry that he's going to defend you even when, guess what? Even when we're guilty. You've got the dream team and you only need one lawyer. It's true. The great high priest. Then it says he's passed through the heavens. This is again is in contrast to the Old Testament. Those guys could only go into the presence of God once a year. They had to prepare. It was elaborate preparation. Cleaning. I'd be scared to death. They used to tie a rope on the high priest's ankle. And he would go in before... And they'd listen. There would be a little bell on that. And they'd listen. Is it still... Can you hear the bell, the tinkling of the bell? Otherwise, they were afraid that God's presence could strike them down. 
Well, Jesus is there, has full access to the Father, and is therefore defending and interceding in every circumstance of his children on an individualized basis. I don't know how that gets done, but he can do it. The Old Testament couldn't do that kind of thing. But the word that you need to notice especially now is Jesus. Jesus. The writer uses Jesus' human name, Yeshua. It's because of Jesus' humanity that even when we err and sin, he has understanding. Have you ever, I've got a slide, have you ever looked at all that Jesus went through? 2 Corinthians 8 9, he was born into poverty. He had a normal human birth, pushed through the birth canal. He's probably had a cone head for it. He had to depend upon a mother wrapped in rags, hunger, thirst, dependent on a mother and father, uh, physical suffering, nursed as a baby, homeless, no room at the inn, walked everywhere for miles, led a fugitive life in his infancy, family troubles, even his own brothers didn't believe in him, separated from God. Have you ever felt separated from God? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It says he grew in wisdom and in knowledge. He had a learning curve. He learned obedience. Figure that one out in your view of Jesus. He, he had to learn. Rejected by men, they crucify him. He's offended even in his hometown. They want to stone him. But in his human condition, though he did not sin, he either he saw it all, he experienced human weakness, how it leads to sin, though he didn't sin. He experienced and saw, and we're going to see his reaction. The horrific stress. You ever gone to Luke where he prays before the cross three times, let this cup pass from me. Angels have to come to strengthen him. He's sweating profusely. If that wasn't Jesus, some of you would say, well, I've got to give you a scripture verse. Aren't you trusting God? See, if Jesus went through that, it's okay for you to have those distressing times. It's okay. We forget the humanity of Jesus. He was tired, hungry, thirsty, exhausted. I thirst. He was so weak that they couldn't, he couldn't carry the cross beam. What kind of humanity did Jesus not experience? All that we're seeing today, even though it's out in the open now, Jesus saw it. In Israel, it was there. There's everything he can relate to, and his response, let me go back, is understanding. But he's also the Son of God. That means that in our difficulties, the Son of God means he has the power and the solution that is for you. He knows exactly what to do, he knows your circumstance. You don't surprise him. Nothing you can tell him can shock him. And therefore, the writer says, let us therefore hold fast our confession. They wanted to run. That's fatal. You cannot run. You must go towards Jesus as the great high priest. Then look at verse 15. It explains why we should hold fast our confession, and it gives a wondrous concept. It uses a double negative in Greek, and it means, for we do not, not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize. Now, what he means is, there's one thing that you can be guaranteed of when you come to him, whether it be sin, failure, whatever it is, guess what you're going to get from Jesus? Sympathy. Do you know what sympathy means? He feels when you hurt. It affects him. He knows and it's affecting him. He is not distant. He so identifies with his people that he, the ground of your, no matter if you've sinned and messed it up fully, here's what you're going to get if you come. 
sympathy. He actually has this feeling of your suffering and suffers in that with you. I can prove it to you. Acts 9, verse 4, when Paul was persecuting the church, you know what Jesus said to Paul? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul didn't touch Jesus. He sure touched the church. And Jesus felt it. And Jesus sympathizes. I want to tell you, it's his humanity where you're guaranteed his full sympathy even if you have sinned. And that's what the Bible says. Don't listen to preachers. I don't think Jesus could have been. Now, I'm going to make you mad. I don't think Jesus could have been a stoic where they just say, ah, what can I do about it? Or a pietist or a Puritan. Puritans wanted to punish. Jesus wants to help to sympathize. And he understands even abject failure that we will get ourselves into. Now look at verse 16. Therefore, let us approach. That's another one of those always approach verbs in Greek. I know what I want to do if I've blown it, sinned, done something. I want to run and hide. I'm ashamed. You know what Paul says because of our great high priest whose humanity completely sympathizes even though he never sinned? You know what it says here? Make it your habit. The moment that happens, don't run. Run toward him, not away from him. He's not hostile. He has a heartfelt understanding of this life. He witnessed it all. He suffered. He didn't sin, but he suffered. Make it your habit to run toward him, therefore, because of the person who guarantees it. So what's the guarantee? If you run toward him, look how you can run toward him. Look at the next word. Let us approach, therefore, with fear and trembling. That's the Old Covenant language when you read that in the Old Testament. It's not the New Covenant. You've got to switch gears now. Let us approach with boldness. I don't feel so bold if I've sinned. I don't feel so bold if I've... <sighs> Paul says because Jesus is so sympathetic to the weakness of the human flesh, he's so m merciful and understanding that you can come, are you ready, with boldness. You know what that word boldness means? It means... Free speech. Have you ever read the Old Testament prophets? Isaiah chapter 20, oh Lord, you've deceived me. I was deceived. And he just really complains. That boldness is what it's saying. You feel discouraged? Lord, I'm discouraged. Where is anything, where is this all going? With boldness, with boldness. Make it your habit with boldness, with boldness, with boldness. Don't run. Come with free speech. Complain. That's the new covenant. Now, in the old covenant, it was a little different. But you're under the new covenant with boldness. And look where you go. To the throne of, are you ready? Grace. There was nothing gracious about the Mosaic Covenant. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It's like the Middle East over there. It's reflecting that culture. They'll cut your head off over there. Well, under the Mosaic Covenant, you could even kill your children if they were disobedient. Sorry, kids. 
My mom would have liquidated me long ago, but <laughs> most parents won't do that, but that's part of that culture. It's gone. You're coming to a throne of unmerited favor. We don't deserve it. Jesus wants to give it to you because he's merciful. He had the human experience. He knows. You can come with boldness. Every time you come, you can come with boldness. You may not feel like it, but this is the promise, the guarantee of the guarantor of our warranty of the new covenant. Leave Moses. Come to Jesus and the new covenant. And then look what he promises. Each time you come, it says, so that purpose we receive when we come each time, no matter how often, you'll never tire him out. You're coming to the throne of grace. It will never be a throne of judgment for his children. Guess what you're going to get under this warranty? Are you ready? Mercy. You know what mercy is? He's not going to account for your past sins. He's going to give you, he's going to lavish his mercy on you. He paid for those sins. It's, we don't take this lightly, but you're guaranteed mercy under this warranty. Mercy looks at the past. Haven't we all? I have terribly blown it. You're guaranteed mercy under this warranty. He's going to give you mercy. Each time you come to the throne of grace, He's going to grant mercy. It's okay. Run to Him. He paid the price. This was not cheap, but He paid the price. And then look what it says. Grace. We're going to find grace that looks to the present and the future. God's going to grant you His unmerited favor. I, but I've sinned. But I've done this. Or I... This doesn't matter. His full, his full humanity guarantees that you're going to get these two things. He knows the human condition is not easy because he suffered it. And then he's going to give us, it says, a well-timed help. Now, what does that mean? That means this, that when you come each time you come, mercy and grace are granted. He will design for you, in his timing, the perfect way to help you. Now, some of you have met, some of you have met some people that we call psychopaths. Well, Dave's a little strange dude on some of this stuff, but uh, I, in my ministry, began to research this. Have you ever... These are the top ten professions of psychopath. Who's number eight? How can you, like, some of these guys take twenty-five, the last $25 of a widow for your airplane and mansion without being... You know what a psychopath is? He has no feeling. Please remember that when you're dealing with man, even preachers, you may be dealing with a psychopath. Why do I bring that up? Well, I bring that up to remind you that when you come to Jesus, forget the preacher. Forget the preacher. Run to Jesus. Mercy, grace. No longer do I call you slaves. I call you friends. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear. But you cry out, what? Because of this new covenant. Daddy, Papa. And you're guaranteed under Jesus. Mercy and grace. Why would you want to go to a preacher, man? They'll throw the book at you. They'll throw the Bible at you. The Mosaic people threw the book at people. Here, I can't. You need to be punished under the book. Jesus will say, I'll help you. I'll help you. And I understand 
Oh, I'd rather much. No wonder David got it right. I'd rather fall into the hands of, of the Lord than men any time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for Jesus' ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.